Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> you are tuned in to Offering Something. I am your host, Michael Bernier. Feeling so good to be alive. You know that's the truth. And you know that I love, love, love you for tuning into the show. Whether you're checking it on YouTube, hit that subscribe button for me, or you're watching on your favorite streaming TV platform, you are wonderful. Thank you, thank you. And a whole lot of thanks to our sponsors at Riverwalk Brewing Company, the Higher Education Music and Arts Festival, Enjoy Your Life brand, and the latest, the Organic Natural Shop. Oh, yeah, this is a good one, my friends. We have an episode in store for you that you're going to love with a guest who is a brand builder, an entrepreneur, a design director, a published author, a pursuer of dreams, a leader, a lecturer, an award-winning creative director, and a free-range parent. (laughs) It is with peace in every breath that I introduce to y'all Libby Delena. Hello. Hey. hey. <laughs> I love that intro. How do you feel? Uh, fantastic. Yeah. Wonderful. Can you do my intro yeah, every I'll single time? Anything. Yes, <laughs> I always. Will. If you always receive it like that, yes. I'm in. Yeah. Well, first, thank you for moving your physical body to this location. You're welcome. I appreciate that effort. It's my very pleasure. kind of you. Yes. Um, I want to be sure you're comfortable. You feel comfortable? I'm really comfortable. Yes. I have yeah. a little puppy at my I feet. Know. and. <laughs> You and I are here, so That's it couldn't right. be better. Puppy named Toast. Toast. Yeah, yes, sir. Toast. <laughs> um, okay, so let's first get into the foundation of the human being that is Libby Delena. Yes. Yeah, I got it right. Yeah, again. yeah, got it. Delena, Delena, Delena. All right. <laughs> so, born where? Place of birth. Hartford, Connecticut. Hartford, Connecticut. Hartford, Connecticut. Did you have a mother, a father, brothers, sisters? All those. I All had the a things. mother, a father, and a brother, and several cats, <laughs> cats. and lovely neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> and you all lived in a house together. We all lived in a house together. The community, it's middle class, upper class, lower class. Where, where are we? Yeah. We're somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Okay. Somewhere in the middle. Um, so you go to school there, elementary school happens? Went to elementary school there, went to high school there, and then busted out and went to college in the western part of Massachusetts. High school years. High school years. You're the coolest kid in the school. You're I, an introvert. I'm, you don't know anyone. You know everyone. Um, I know everyone. Introvert was six feet. So being female ah, and six feet in high school, kind out-ish. of a, a bummer. Kind of a bummer. It was a bummer. Right? It was a bummer. It was more like you were always seen. I kind of wanted to hide. I was okay. also a jock. And I am almost 60 years old, which is fucking awesome can you say can i say (laughs) say anything (laughs) represent yourself however you choose i love you um it's you we want uh, thank you um and um i I was a jock and in the late 80s for women girls that wasn't really what everybody wanted to be Mm. everybody kind of wanted to be something else um and so i spent a lot of time on the field hockey field the basketball court and lacrosse field and Spent a lot of my time doing that. It's where I was happiest. I think in part because I was outdoors and moving. Uh, yeah, so I yeah. loved it. Uh, then went on to college, as I said, in the western part of this state, Massachusetts, and fell in love with rowing. So with rowing. Rowing. Yeah. So you're in college. How do you how do you yeah. end up rowing? What are we rowing? And we're rowing in a big big shell of eight people. Okay. Yeah, the crew it's like a team. College team. I've crew seen this. Team. I've seen him in the Charles River. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So on the crew team, yeah. and really, what happens if you step onto <laughs> any campus and you're six feet tall, you either get recruited uh, for the basketball team, everything, or the rowing team. And I'd played basketball, and I really wasn't very good. I mean, I really wasn't. I didn't love it. But I thought I'd try the crew team, and I basically majored in rowing for the next four years. I loved it so wow. much. Yeah. So. What was it you loved about rowing? The fitness, the feeling, the competition, the drive, the camaraderie? Great question. I think the answer is yes. Um, All of this. All of it, right? Um, The thing about rowing is you tend to get up at the crack of dawn because the water is really flat. Mm -hmm. You have a very, very intense experience when you row. Like it hurts a lot. You burn up really fast, meaning as you start a race, you're into anaerobic territory fast. So that means... 
everybody in the boat is feeling the same thing. So you yep. feel sort of connected. You know, when you go through something oh, hard with huge people. Huge connection there. And you, um, so very connected to the team. I guess I had a streak of competitiveness in it that satiated it. Um, you can't I just, stop when you're rowing you on a team. You can't stop. That's There's correct. No, there are times There's inevitably no where you're like, I need to stop, but right. you don't because you, don't. you got. You said eight people in the cruise. You get seven folks around you yes. that you're not letting down. That's Libby. right. There's eight ah, rowers and one that. coxswain. And the coxswain is a person who kind of it organizes He's everything. Like, right, yes. left, and steers the lingo and is. gives everybody the signals. So there's eight rowers and one coxswain. And there isn't kind of a, hey, here, let's take a timeout and a breather. And most races are... 2,000 meters, which means about six minutes of racing. Yeah. And I would say by about the 30th stroke, which is maybe 30 to 90 seconds in, you're burning up. So oh, you want to yeah. stop. So it's kind of a mind game at that <sighs> game point. Game on. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Wow. But um, it was great. Let's step back to being tall. I, okay. I, I always have this vision, and I need to ask this question. Sure. At some point, did you have any neck issues because you're tall and you do this bending down thing oh. to fit in more? What a great question. I've seen question. this with a lot of tall people. They have this curvature in your neck, yeah. and when you break it down, it's, I was tall. I always was above everyone, so I started to naturally bend myself down to avoid it. And then at some point in life, I gained the confidence of a tall person. I was yes. cool with it, yeah. and I straightened myself out. Yeah. Did you go through this process at all? Great question. Yeah. I think the answer is undoubtedly yes. I don't remember that. What I remember, actually, my dad, 6'5", yep. um, probably seeing me do that, would take his hands uh, right and pull either put his hand between my shoulders, which was yep. just sort of a like stand up and be you, yep. put his hands on my shoulders. He also, for my 16th birthday, um, you know, which is the late 70s. Platform shoes, a big deal. He gave me a pair of platform shoes. Ooh. So I was six feet, and these platform <laughs> shoes were probably three six, inches. Six, here we go. So it was sort of like, if you're going to be tall, you might as well own like, go it. Go for it. Go for it. Exactly. So to have a parent who was... Um, yeah, was He's encouraging me to be taller? I love okay, this man. Great. Yes, right. So I think the answer is undoubtedly I did, but yep. I was supported by people who would remind me to stand stand in my place all yeah. right we're back in college we're back in college. i know you said rowing was the major but was yeah. there an actual academic major there was um i studied philosophy, philosophy. which um interestingly everybody of course always says what are you going to do with that and my sarcastic <laughs> response was i'm going to think I'm, exactly. just, I'm going to be and i'm going to think um but it was a great major so when you get out of college, yeah. are you going to tell us what the name of the college was? Are we at like UMass? Oh, I, went, I went to Mount Holyoke College, okay. an all-women's all right. college. All right. Uh, one of the seven sisters or seven it colleges, does. yeah, that uh, are no longer all all women, but um, yeah. So you graduate Mount Holyoke yeah. with this degree in philosophy. Right. Do you try to get a job in that field immediately, <laughs> or are you drawn to something else right out of the gate? First job has nothing to do with the world of philosophy. Um, correct, nothing to do with philosophy. <laughs> yeah. So here's what happened. So and when I was rowing, I rowed in a category that was called lightweight, which meant lightweight. I, the lightweight category. I could have rowed in the regular weight, but um, I rowed in the lightweight category, which meant I had to weigh in at 135 pounds. At six feet, that was very challenging for that me. That seems I'm usually, quite slender. Yeah. I usually am 155, Yeah. all right? And I don't care talking about my weight. That's you look great. Well, the don't, numbers either mean way, nothing. It doesn't yeah. matter. <laughs> Who cares? So, um, you know, that's 20 pounds from where I am. It yeah. was very hard to get there. And so I spent quite a bit of time, um, believe it or not, reading cookbooks, just enjoying the concept of cooking and food wow. and the deliciousness of food. What that led to was my best friend and I, also in the same category, <laughs> we ended up going to cooking school in New York. So after rowing for a couple of years, we went to cooking school and thought maybe what we would do would be to open up a restaurant or something. So Let's we spent be a good chefs. Let's be chefs. Um, we love food. We know about food. We really um, love the craft. Yep. Um, so then we went out to California, out to a little community called Olima, which is near Point Reyes and right, uh, right north of San Francisco. And um, we're planning on opening up a restaurant there, the unfortunate reality was the the building the Olima Inn which we were going to 
set up as our restaurant yes. never got their occupancy permit. Uh. So we sort of shut down that concept. And um, what I really realized at that moment, what I really loved about that whole process was um, figuring out the graphics for oh. the restaurant. I so loved you were like coming up with the name, the logo, the, the branding, menu, right. the colors. That's right, the interiors. And so I just paused and thought, okay, food isn't going to be the way I move forward. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move forward into design. And so came back to the East Coast and took a bunch of design classes and entered a new phase of, of life and career. <laughs> so this new phase of life and career, did it start off immediately in the world of being an entrepreneur or did you try to get a job? So I tried to get a job. So I... Um, I want to be your designer. I want to do all your marketing. I want to make the commercials. That's right. And they're like, so does everybody so else. So does everybody else. So <laughs> um, right down the street from where we are in Wenham, Hamilton Wenham, was a really highly, highly, still highly regarded, one of the best ad agencies in the country named Mullen Advertising. Yep. It was in Wenham, Mass. And I got a freelance job there, was eventually hired full time and stayed for 15 years ended up um, as the design director at Mullen. Um, and it, that was a glorious, glorious experience. I had no reason to be yep. hired. I was not good enough. I was not skilled enough. Um, but I guess I had something that was but appealing. You, so you would say that the manager or the person in position of hiring you saw the light. He had that Peter Drucker skill, and he was like, yep, this is going to turn into what we want. It's going to take some time. I think that's probably right. Yeah. Uh, two really incredible creative directors, Paul Silverman and Edward Boches, um, two incredibly highly regarded people in the ad world. Um, I actually think my skill was less about design mm -hmm. specifically and more about um, being able to present and in the ad world, to be able to strategically present an idea to clients, often a room full of clients, is a, is a skill that is valued. And I um, am comfortable doing that yeah. and can do that. So I think actually that was probably more my area of expertise than the actual some people would produced. rather die than speak in front of That's an audience. Correct. You're out there like I'm shining it's right fine. now. I'm actually this is living mine. a little more <laughs> That's right. in this moment. That, yeah. And that's where being six feet, I think, helps. You can't help but stand in front of uh, people and um, have some kind of presence just physically. So I stayed there for 15 years, um, worked on some incredible brands, BMW for a long period of time, Timberland, Eddie Bauer, L.L. Bean. I mean, Mullen had some of the top brands in the world as clients. And um, when I first started, there were 60 people at Mullen. By yep. the time I left, there were several offices, 600. And was there another word added to it? Low. Mullen Low. It's now Mullen Low. Yeah. Okay. And so um, while I was there, um, I mean, it was just uh, an incredible opportunity because uh, Jim Mullen, who started it, was really was a real true craftsman, meaning mm -hmm. um, he really he, it mattered to him how ink went on a paper. The kerning of a headline mattered. The color mattered. So, so it was a craft. You knew all these things that you were naturally, like the detail that you were paying attention to, like Loved. wasn't going to be overlooked. Like why are you wasting your time making that one little R right. at the end of this look so perfect? That's like, right. He's like, oh, yeah. That, yes. Um, and he was a unique character, I would say. I mean, that, the agency itself was unique in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, the craftsmanship of an ad, believe it or not, hard to believe in this day and age, but the craftsmanship mattered. Yeah. And so it was, real, it was truly a privilege to work there. Um, Before so, I, I'm, yeah. I'm going to lead into all of these incredible yeah. accomplishments you have, but I wanted to start that with, was there a mentor, somebody for you that showed, that let you know that this stuff is real, we can make this happen, this is normal, and supported you in the effort, any questions, strategy? Is this the Mullen character? Was he- Jim Mullen, yeah. He was, yeah, you he, consider him a mentor, or was there someone else on the side that you were looking to for help, assistance, no, and I would, overall knowledge? It's a great question. I don't think I've ever been asked that. I would say Jim Mullen was one of those, but he was also running the agency. Right. So his availability or accessibility was perhaps 
limited than he wasn't somebody I would go to every day. It but wasn't his, so much personal phone calls at the end of the day, like, hey, I had this a, idea. It was a way of looking at what it was that we were doing, that, yep. saying that the, the details, as you beautifully articulated, yep. the details that mattered to us, in fact, mattered to clients. So one of my first accounts was Rolls Royce. Okay. Yes. I was a new details. Details. Yes. So think about this. I go on my oh, first yeah. shoot, honestly, as an art director, and I open up the trunk of this Bentley R. Yeah. And there's a piece of chrome that goes a oh, one single piece of chrome that goes all the way around. And I just pause for a minute and guess what? Every single screw head was perfectly aligned. It wasn't oh. as if they had been screwed in and Wherever left. It ended. They were perfectly Aligned. North, south, east, west. Baby. That's right. And I remember Paul Silverman, one of our creative directors, saying, "Our ads have to be as exquisitely executed as the cars themselves, because wow. an ad is the stand-in for the product until someone sees the product." Yeah. So I happen to love typography, kerning, and leading are things I love. So, <laughs> and that's the space between letters, the space between. Yes. And he. I'm, as soon as I understood that, which was, again, this is, I mean, this feels like Mad Men era, but the ads were in place of the product, so they had to be exquisite. They had to be perfect. Um, this is all that the potential end consumer is going to see to represent the product. That's the right. internet doesn't right. exist at the level that it does in any way. Oh. It's like, here's the picture this is pre in the paper. <gasps> Pre-computers. Oh, yep. Right. They're going to see three pictures. Yep. We're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars right. on these ads. That's right. These are going to represent our product. That's right. Did the picture of the strip of chrome or the screws perfectly <laughs> align make it into this No, ad? it didn't, but I just remember that Did you that mention was, it in the story? I, to so, I, I certainly did to my creative director, and yeah. that's why he said, you know what, your ad needs to be as perfect as that. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, so in any case, spent 15 years there working on exquisite, exquisite brands. And one of my favorite stories was um, we were shooting for Eddie Bauer Christmas. Yeah. And uh, snow in North America was on a glacier just north of Whistler. All so right. um, we had to shoot in snow. We were shooting Christmas. It was probably July or something. Christmas in July. That's All right. right. So, I mean, this is the ad world, and for someone who loves adventure, it's heavenly. So um, we go out there to shoot on the glacier, and we spend a month shooting, but the way, way we get up to and fro the, gla the glacier is helicopter. So we commute via helicopter every day. Every day. Every day up to and this. now the helicopter is totally normalized to totally, you. Totally, totally normalized. It's so cool to, like, drink in your coffee. Right, I know. Back and, on the elevator. And, um, <laughs> yeah, not only that. Um, you know, below the helicopter were, um, were in fact, oh, brother, were in fact uh, carrying those big nets. All so the goods. You, you, all the goods that we're carrying up. So as you sit in the helicopter and you go up slowly, up comes this big net filled with all, all the, the production gears all in there, the, production the cameras, gears, everything. all the rigs, all the everything. <laughs> I mean, oh, wow. we did set up a little tent village once we got to the top for, yep. but, um, so that's, that's what advertising in the late, early nineties was I like. Love it. Yeah. It's a blast. We're 15 years at Mullen Low. <laughs> it's a wonderful experience for you. And then is it immediately we are co-founding is Mechanica? Mechanica? Yeah. So, um, I always want to say Mechanica. Oh, well, that's beautiful it's too. Like a, a Latin flair to <laughs> yeah, it. I'm really right. into this. I like but I'll it. stick with Mechanica. Mechanica. So, and how does that transition occur? So, um, while at uh, Mullen, I worked with, honestly, I think some of the best in the business, uh, including my two partners who we went on to found Mechanica. So, founded Mechanica with Ted Nelson, who is head yeah. of strategy at Mullen, and Jim Garaventi, one of the best copywriters in the business, quite honestly, creative director at Mullen. And one of the things Jim Mullen always said about Mullen was that he wanted it to be an entrepreneurial kind of mindset when you were there, meaning you could make decisions on your own about things and then ask for forgiveness later, but he yeah. wanted people to lean in and take the initiative. Um, so he sort of raised us all to be entrepreneurial. So we got to a place, Ted Nelson, Jim Garaventi, and myself, where we thought, 
A, and I want to be really clear about this. There was nothing wrong with being at Mullen. It was an incredible privilege. We yes. just kind of got this itch. I was about 40, been raised in this entrepreneurial yeah. environment. It was like, hey, let's try our own thing. Ultimately let's encouraged. It a yes, right. He was aware in his head what he was doing he because was. he loved the, himself being an entrepreneur. Exactly. So he's not going to take, as a good human, he's not going to try to hide right. that from you. In right. fact, when we went to go tell him, he said, this is perfect. This is what I expected you to do. Very he also said, you. if you if it doesn't work out, you're more than welcome to come back. <laughs> yes. I mean, we love good <laughs> this people. Guy's the best. The best. Yeah, that's, <laughs> so that's it, how it should work. It is. Yeah, that's, that's a good right. human. Yeah. Um, so again, nothing was wrong. We just sort of thought, hey, let's try this ourselves. Actually, the industry was changing dynamically. Mm -hmm. um, things needed to shift, and so we tried a sort of a new model of ad agency, which isn't really I, I, happy to go into, but um, it it was a, just a new way of thinking about advertising, yep. which was super fun. And so, yeah, my colleagues and I doing that for 16 years. I just recently left, and they continue on. They're doing great, and I'm now moving on to other areas and other things. But was really fortunate because I had two amazing, high-powered, wildly successful, kind partners who yeah. I knew from, we'd known each other a long time. We'd traveled a lot together, so we knew each other's ebbs and flows of life. Leads so, me to two uh, questions. How did, how did, was the headquarters always in Newburyport? It here? was, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did that decision come to be? Yeah, it's a great one. Part of it was, I think, you know, I, I don't know. We were we were at that phase in our lives, I guess, where the the idea of commuting. And Mullen mm -hmm. Mullen at that point was going to be moving out of Wenham into Boston. I see. As we all know, that commute from here into Boston is is not living. Yeah. it's not living. Yeah. It's it's a lot. And I think we all sort of felt we knew we were probably going to go try our own thing. If we're going to eliminate a commute, let's really <laughs> yeah. eliminate the commute, right? Exactly. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, we found a spot down. We started here and stayed Fair here. Fair enough. Next question. Over yeah. those, the course of those 16 years, yeah. right, um, through growth, maturity, yeah. was there some constant uh, theme or something that really was the differentiation point that allowed Mechanica to continue to exist, grow, and hit maturity where it was a sustainable business? Why would I go to you guys when we know there's thousands of other people that are advertising saying they do what you do? Yeah, yeah. So why is it that people ended up with you? It's a really fair question. I think we were, um, number one, we were super I'm at Mullen. Yeah. So we had, I, I don't like the word reputation, but we had been in the is business a while. Reputation had, does have like this kind of pompous negative thing, but right. the truth is, uh, we'd been in the for business lack of a, a better while. word. Yep. Yeah, we'd been there for a while. We had, we had over the course of all those years at M Mullen, had a lot of clients, and a lot of those clients knew we were leaving and were interested in potentially continuing to work with us. Now the thing is, because we were smaller, we had much less overhead. Yeah. So in a way, one could argue, oh gosh, I'm getting Mullen talent at a cheap price. We, we also yeah. had a different sort of model, which is too much to go into on this conversation. <laughs> yeah. But, um, <laughs> you know, uh, I guess the conversation really was, you know, um, these people have, have proven themselves. Yeah. And um, again, we had a, a lot of connections at that point. We of were very course. fortunate, yeah. So, now your work has been featured on the One Show Awards, D and A D, Fast Company, Aegis, Graphis, and on and on. You've also been profiled by the BBC Radio Four series, The Chain. Let's just like, how does that happen? BBC hits you up, and it's like, hey, you are the coolest. Let's get something going. Oh my gosh! No, in fact, that is really um, hot pursuit. No, that was um, a really, really fabulous dear friend of mine, a woman named Maggie Doyne. Look Maggie her up. Maggie Doyne, yep. She, um, who I have a very close relationship with, uh, started an organization called Blink Now, where uh, does a lot of work over in Nepal. In any case, 
She's the hot ticket, honestly. And She's so this, the hot ticket. So the, the, <laughs> the concept of the chain yep. was that they would interview one person, and then that person would say who the next person they should interview. And uh, on I and gotcha. On. Yeah. So they interviewed Maggie, and Maggie said, oh, you should interview Lib. So no, they were not pursuing me. <laughs> they pursued Maggie, who was then very generous and <laughs> shared my name. So... D and D award winner. What D and A D is that yes. what, how I yeah. would say that? Award, design, what is it? design art direction. It is a beautiful, highly regarded publication in the world of, you know, type nerds. Yeah, art everybody direction. seems to really care about this. Yes. So well, so, you, <laughs> so yeah. and yeah. you're getting awards from them. We'll leave that at that. Yeah. Um, this is like the most beautiful thing of all. So it's 2011, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you decide you're going to start walking. Yes, sir. And here we are now. I think it's 2022. And since then, if I am speaking the truth here, you have walked some distance every single day. I don't mean like walked around the house, went upstairs. You left. I'm um, going out for a walk every single day for the last, is that 11 years now? 10 years. Yeah. 10 years. 10 years. Come here, Noodle. All right. And with that, you've now walked the circumference of the, the entire Earth. beautiful planet Earth. That's right. Was that the plan on the first walk? It was not. The plan was, um, it was just, you know, a few years into having started Mechanica and yep. uh, very fortunate, healthy family, great business, dear friends, incredible community, had yep. absolutely nothing to complain about. But what I began to realize was a key piece of who I was had kind of... I wasn't, I did, hadn't acknowledged, I hadn't uh, You forget fed. about the whole philosophy side of things? I forgot that I am happiest outdoors. Oh. I need to be outdoors. And much, much of my day at that moment was, again, mom and, you know, running errands in meetings, all good. Yeah. Again, nothing, there was nothing to complain about. I just realized, oh, wow, I need to be outdoors. I need to yeah, I need some be planful. Mm -hmm. I need to be planful. And... I believe you make time for things that matter, not find time. So it's not like, oh, today I'm going to find 10 minutes. No, I decided I would get up earlier before I usually did and get on my shoes and go for a walk. And I'm um, over here going, she's saying my things right now. <laughs> oh, you don't great. just have a good day. You make the plan to have that, a good that's day. Right. You that's enjoy right. your life. You take action to implement things yes. that are going to allow you to enjoy your life. You that's don't right. just wait for it to happen. You don't wait for it wake to happen. Wake up earlier. Wake up Stay earlier. Stay up later. And I mm. always talk about do you want to um, minimize the time between waking and walking. <laughs> so yes. in the winter where there's friction points, where there's places where you can begin, you begin to say, oh, I'm not going to go today. Ah, it's raining. Well, figure out what it is that's making you say I don't want to go and solve it. Just solve it. I don't want to go for a shorter walk, go half an hour, get some good rain gear. Like there's nothing in um, those stories that we tell ourselves for why we can't. Oh, you need yeah. rest. You need, and I always say to people, the, um, the days you don't want to go are the days you really you need to, to go. go. And it, as soon as you have that in your mind, when you wake up, when I wake oh, up and so I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't really want to go today. I didn't sleep well. I, I know that when I go, I will learn the most. I will see the most. Oh. I will be grateful for it the most. And when I get home, honestly, especially on some of those days where it's gnarly weather, yep. I feel like a fucking rock star. That's what I'm saying. You're on the top of the mountain. You're on the top of the mountain. You're not getting to your desk going like this. No, oh, that's right. Who do I have to call? Maybe I'll wait a little bit. And you're already like, boom, you're trying to make the call. At eight. Is it too early to call? That's right. I'm on it. <laughs> now, granted, I do know that I... we live in a beautiful place. Yeah. So there's the nourishment of the Atlantic Ocean and it would mm. be different, I think, if I were in, so nice. I don't know, da even somewhere else. Yes. Um, I also know at that phase, my kids were old enough, so it was easy to walk out of the house and not worry. Yep. So yeah. um, I do know the privilege of my ecosystem that enabled me to do that. But I really thought I would do it for 30 days. And here I am 10 years later. This walking ultimately inspired your first published book as an author, appropriately titled Do Walk, navigate earth, mind, and body step by step. Yes, sir. There was no plan of writing a book there when sure you started wasn't. walking. No, there sure wasn't. Isn't this and beautiful? 
Yeah, it's amazing. The other thing that the walking enabled me to do is actually write that book because um, <laughs> quite honestly, yeah, um, I'm not a writer. Yeah. And I know I'm not supposed to say that. Everybody's like, oh, yeah, you are. You just wrote a book. I'm like, no, I know writers. People love hearing that. I know. Yeah. Yes. I know writers. You're I know a human. really good writers. People, I mean, some of the best authors in the country I know, which I'm very fortunate. Mm -hmm. um, I am not one of them. What I did was tell some stories, right? I, um, You'd say you're a good storyteller. Perhaps. As or maybe opposed not to even writer? good. I, I told some stories. Uh, you're a storyteller. And I made some I like lists. your inability to give yourself any credit <laughs> on this topic. Yeah. Um, you know, it's really, it's um, published by an organization called the Do Book Company. And they have published about 30 books. And they're really little how-tos. So this book is, has some sort, little journal entries. It has some lists. It has some thoughts. Um, but, um, yeah, and, okay, so here's the Yahoo, which is Yahoo! published in July. It sold out. 5,000 copies. Come on. So that's awesome. And so they're republishing What was the publishing it house again? The Do Book Company, which Do is book company. affiliated with the Do Lectures, mm -hmm. of which I am in love with. So, um, yeah. Hold on. When did this get published? July. July 2021? 2021, yeah. And you went through 5,000? I think that's right, yeah, 5,000. Physical copies? Physical yeah. People aren't really making moves like that. You're, you're, <laughs> you're in awesome. the lane. <laughs> hey, I mean, you know, Especially. I don't know if anybody liked it, but I, there it is. <laughs> wow, that's a lot of units in so, this day and time where so many people aren't even actually purchasing the physical I know. book. I know. I that's know. very impressive. Yeah. Wow. Um, so I'm calling it a success, and you're doing another run of this 5,000 books. Are you going to do 10,000 this I time? I have no idea. It's up to them. Not okay. Me. All right. All right. <laughs> They're doing their projections. They've already had yeah, the market research in place. Um, so knowing that you're like this branding person and design, and you know how to get the story to the people, was there a particular shoe you were wearing, and did that brand get involved in this walk around the earth? Yes, sir. So um, I have, uh, for the last several years, not, yes. not all 10 years, but for the last several years, worn Hoka's. And Hoka. Hoka, mm -hmm. yep. Um, One of the most respected running yep. athletic shoes. It's great. In, in, the world, I assume, I, but uh, most certainly I, in this country. Small brand, but yep. yeah, kind of with that mega um, outsole. In any yep. case, um, you know, they have been incredibly supportive. Um, I do some work with them and tell people about Hoka's, written some blog posts for them. And actually, when the book came out, they um, help, sort of helped get the word out because I did a couple of posts for them that they put on their Instagram. Yeah. And it was really... So I love them. Uh, they're, they're absolutely the best, and I love their shoes. So <laughs> it works. <laughs> I'm picking up a vibe that you got a lot of Hoka shoes at home. <laughs> I, <laughs> no I, shortage. I have, I have no shortage of shoes, correct. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So is the concept behind this nonfiction self-help book along the lines of Walking every day can be transformative and lead to personal or inner enlightenment? I, yes. I, I think the thing that's so powerful, one could say it about running, but I think the thing about walking um, that's so transformative is um, if we are able-bodied, and I do not take my able-bodied for granted. It is yep. a privilege. But... Walking is what makes us human, right? It's mm. what makes us human. It, um, it is very small d democratic, meaning you really don't have to buy any special gear. You don't need a super fancy bike. You don't need a time slot at a gym. Yep. You don't need a membership. Those are all wonderful, by the way. You just need a door to you get just, out of the you house. You just, just need a door. Yeah. And um, I also think there is something really profound about um, moving through a neighborhood, a uh, a street, a beach, at foot speed, you see the world differently. You just you know it, the potholes. You, you know, know where the brick is missing. You right. have this solid relationship yep. with this little this city, earth. like no one else does. That's right, right here, That's in the right. same way that I do from running the streets. That's right. And I love seeing you out when we're yeah. running. And I think the thing about going the same route often is what looks uh, a certain way on one day will look different on the next day. 
So it is this, I always say, the thing about walking for me as an art director is it really taught me how to see, yep. not just look. So I have this one route, okay, Wiggly. Um, I have this one route that I do frequently, and um, it is that route where I learned to really see, because I go past this same barn. She looked different every single day. She yeah. looked different because of the weather, the season, what I was feeling. Hi. And... Um, and I saw her place in the community. I mean, it was a place where some of the dairy cows were kept. And yep. the impact that barn had on this community yeah. was, and otherwise I'd just be driving past it. I'd be just flying by. And the thing about walking is it does make you slow down and, and see things, truly see. Clearly a grounding experience. You yeah. become more That's connected right. yeah. to your surroundings, yeah. to the earth. That's right. So a question that comes from this, where the walking is this transformative thing that leads you to X, is the following. Do you now consider yourself enlightened? Oh, I think that's a lifelong pursuit. I think maybe enlightenment is, in fact, the pursuit of it. Yeah. It is not an end state. So the thing I about like the... The step by step is the thing about a walk is like the journey is the reward here. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And you know there'll be days where I go up for a walk along Plum Island, and I'll park in parking lot one, walk out to Hellcat, turn around and come yeah. back, and there's a stinking headwind. Um, <laughs> and the only thing, and it's blowing light, and it's raining, and the rain's getting down into everything, and it's miserable. And the only thing one can do in that moment is just go step by step and it's yeah. true in many things in life right so yeah. it's just take the next step take the next step that's it you and don't have to concern yourself with 500 steps from now absolutely not and it's the, like the next breath is really the only one that matters because without it you're gone that's right that's exactly yeah. right yeah. and i would say again i don't overlook the privilege of being ho able to go home to a a warm house yep. and a dryer and you know safety and yeah so yeah <laughs> Hey, toast. <laughs> toast behind the curtain. Um, you comfortable with a gift? Can I give you a gift? Oh, I'd love it. I'm going to give you a gift. Um, amazing. Yeah. I would love that. Oh, my. The gift to be opened now. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Enjoy my life. Enjoy your life. There it is. Enjoy your life, yes. Riverwalk Brewing. Uh, all our people to uh, see organic yes. natural shops. Yes, sir. Yeah, there you go. I know the terminology. <laughs> a nice boat neck. It's nice and cozy for nice your spring and cozy. walk. Yeah, I love yeah. It. What else? Thank you. A tank top. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Enjoy your life, Brand. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> Thank you. Of course. And there's uh, some beautiful natural products in uh, there from the beer. good people at the Organic Natural Shop. Uh, a beer. Thank all types you. Of things beautiful. For you. Yeah. Amazing. Of course. Gifts are good. Gifts are good. Um, here we go. Why are you considered a tea snob? Oh. Oh. Toast oh, didn't like that no. question. He's ready to go. Yeah. Uh, tea snob. Um, I have only always drunk tea my entire life, and I'm one of those people that... I hate to say it, but if you bring, if I ask for tea and you bring me a Lipton tea bag, I'd, oh, rather, golly. I'd rather not drink it. Yeah, I wouldn't I drink mean, it. No, no, not it. No offense to poor Lipton. I'm sure yep. it's fine tea. Great but, job, yeah, but oh it's gosh, not for are me. Are you done, mister? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> um, you're an aspiring pilot? Yes, I'm hopefully getting my pilot. Uh, was, I'm on path. I've been flying out at the Plum Island Airport. And right really? before the pandemic, um, I had signed up to go down to flight school Um and just fly for an entire week to just sort of get it. But then the pandemic rolled in, so still in the process of that. You're in the process. Yes. Um, you're an advocate for female leadership. Let's think about this. Now, specific to the community that we're living in, do you feel like it's a good balance, male-female leadership in Newburyport, Massachusetts? Is it, is it out of balance? Are we no. doing all right here? What's your, what's your thought what on that? Question. Specific to Newburyport. Great question. I know we just transitioned from a... Female, what do we call this? A mayor? Mayor. mayor yeah. Into oh, a male ma mayor? Yeah. Does that offset the system a little bit? Have you ever no. had this thought? No, I haven't had that thought. I think, I mean, this is a pretty, seems like a pretty healthy community. It does. Um, but I don't think I've ever, that's a great question. I have to think on that. Okay. I'll get back to you. Fair enough. Yeah. 3% movement. Mm. What is this? 3% movement, a mm. terrific organization 
started by a, a really smart woman who's in Kat Gordon, who's your friend and in the ad business. When I first started in the ad industry, of the creative directors in ad agencies, I know this is a very niche conversation, but only three we percent like were women. Yep. Oh, so I'm really? a creative director. Three percent of creative wow. directors, and it's it now going like up. like a small number. Seems like a small number, especially with the talk on details. I find in my judgmental ways that often women do a better job of paying attention to details. Call me what you want to call me for saying this, but I'm surprised. Three percent. Yeah, three percent. It's definitely changed. It's gone up now, but um, it's interesting because, needless to say, um, marketing is. Um, tell, I, I believe the best marketing takes the passion of a brand the inside workings of a brand and simply shares it with the external world. Yes. Right? Whatever is powerful at Rolls-Royce or Eddie Bauer, what they're passionate about, uh, my job was simply to take that passion and share it with a larger audience. I don't think that has anything to do with male or female. No, it doesn't. That being, but that being said, it is valuable. most of the people making decisions about purchases are, in fact, female. So it's... It, it was, it's just interesting. And so that industry is shifting. The ad industry is shifting. But at the time, 3% of creative directors were women. But so is it? Is, it's gone up. Just a question. Yeah. Is it, can it still be called a 3%? I think it can because they're still pointing out that not long ago, 10 years. It was years, 3%. I mean, 10 all right, years. The, the number is now 4%? I think it's like, uh, uh, no, I think it's 20. What? Oh, great. That's great. That's plus still, 17? But think, yeah. But think about it, it. One quarter. Yeah. Of the creative directors in this country are women. <laughs> as long as the number is increasing, we yeah, feel good. Yeah, that's right. We'll give it to us. Um, yeah. So did you jump out of a helicopter? I think I heard this. I didn't jump out of a helicopter. I jumped out of an airplane. An airplane? Yeah. With the parachute? Yes, sir. And that experience overall? Awesome. The best. Amazing. Doing it again? I, yeah, I would do it again. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, see, I have this thing, and I'm a risk taker yeah. by nature. Yeah. I like the, the uh, stepping out of the comfort zone, all these things. But for some reason, I, I have this it. fundamental thing that is man on the land. I get it. I, I totally Fish get it. Fish in the it. sea, birds yeah. in the sky. I totally get it. There are definitely, th I mean, I wouldn't go scuba diving through a tunnel <laughs> underwater. So that's the place I'm, that's not, I, in the darkness. I, I'd rather jump than go down. So that's just, that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> We're almost done. Yeah, that's right, little buddy. Um, <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Would you say this is that you have arrived at the position where you are in life overall as a result of luck, chance, and laziness? Or are you in this position because you actually put in the effort and worked hard and took steps every day towards the goal that you took the time to define? Um, yes. Yes. So luck, ch luck, chance, laziness, absolutely, and then effort. So effort. probably all for it. Um, I was incredibly lucky to get hired at Mullen. As I yes, said earlier, I, there this, was yeah. no reason I should have been hired, quite honestly. So pure luck. Uh, that was chance that I lived here and such an extraordinary agency was 20 miles away. I mean, even if I lived 10 miles further north, it would be too far a commute. Yep. That's chance. Laziness, I think, you know, I stayed there for 15 years, probably out of some sort of laziness and then effort. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think I am where I am today because of 10 years of walking effort. So yeah. all of it. All of it. So we're excited about life currently. Oh, gosh, yeah. I have two more questions. Please. What is new and exciting in your world? What are we right now like? Can we um, talk about it or no? Yes, okay. sure. So um, This means you're excited. Yeah, like, yeah, oh yeah, God, yeah, totally. So there's a couple of things. I think um, I, I won't mention who yet, but I think I'm going to start a little mini, what's called, we're calling a micro podcast. Yeah. Which um, is going to be about walking. It's not really a podcast, it's a conversation, let's call yep. it that. Um, I also am really into cold plunging, Wim Hofing. I know Wim Hofing is Hof. not fun. a verb, but... Um, hey, it could be. could be. So, man is on to something. Big time. Mm -hmm. So for two years, I've been getting in the cold water, and um, now there's a group of us who do it every Friday and every Sunday. And the last, uh, one of the last Fridays, there were 35 people getting in the water together over... 
One more time. Every Friday and every Sunday? So Right now. E- yep. And the Instagram handle for this group is ebb, E-B-B, yep. dot and, A-N-D, dot flow, dot collective. Ebb and flow collective. Ebb and flow collective. So follow it. Yep. Um, you know, we don't broadcast where we're plunging because most of the time it's women and sometimes it's us by ourselves. Yep. So just ask people to DM us and we'll share where we are. Right on. Um, and so we get in the water. Every every Friday, every Sunday as a group, and then we often go by ourselves. It's amazing. So great. <laughs> my last question before yeah. my closing statement. Yeah. What are you doing to make the world a better place on a personal level at this point in your life? How mm-hmm. are you making the world a more loving, peaceful, happy, unifying place for yeah. humans to exist on? What a beautiful question. Um, I think for me, my, I always say um, going for a walk is an act, a radical act of love, right? You're toast. Yeah, huh? It's a radical act of love. It's love for yourself. Yep. It's love for the planet. It's love for the next turn in the road. It's love for the weather. You can't. I can't help but go out and not feel like... I am the luckiest person on the planet. Yeah. Right? Walking your way to making the world a better place. So, there's two reasons why I asked you to come here today. Yeah. All right. They're both very clear, and you have most certainly backed them here. The first is I think it's praiseworthy, uh, valuable for not just yourself, but for everyone who comes in contact with you when you. Find a passion or find a calling in this life or a dream. Mm -hmm. And instead of looking at it as something that you cannot accomplish, this is not attainable. Other people do that and putting people on pedestals. You actually didn't dismiss the thought or the notion. You set it there. You took the steps that are necessary to accomplish not just one goal in your life, but goal after goal. That is beautiful. You don't have to do that, but something in you drew you to follow your dreams, your passion. That is admirable. I love you for doing that. Okay. Second reason of the two. As you go through this journey that you've been through and many others like you have been through and you arrive at a position where you're a successful person, you have these, this reputation and you have other successes that surround you you can easily develop a different type of personality. Your character can shift from Mm. being kind and hungry and ready to do this to a different kind of person that's not a pleasure. But you, Libby, as Mm. I see here today and every time I see you around, have managed, or maybe there's been no management, to actually be a good person that people want to be around. Mm. You're offering something positive to the world. Beautiful. That's so good. (laughs) I love you for that. I love you for being here. Um, do we want people to connect with you? Is there some sort of social media handle, something like this? We, I know it's LibbyDelana.com, but that's D-E-L-A-N-A, L-I-B-B-Y-D-E-L-A-N-A.com. Social media thing we're pushing out there? Sure. Is um, My Instagram handle is Park, P-A-R-K, here. Park is my middle name. Mm-hmm. Started 10 years ago. Um, also, ThisMorningWalk.com. Okay. And uh, Instagram handle this morning walk. So, yeah. I know Thank the you. book is gone and it's sold out, but what if we want to read it? Um, so if you go to thismorningwalk.com, I'll, there'll be a note when it's back in stock. The Audible version is available and the Kindle version is available right cool. now. So. All right. Yeah. I love you. I really appreciate you being here today. It's a p- pleasure. Absolute great questions. Thank well you. Well done. Toast, I love you. <laughs> yeah. So, Libby Delano, my sweet, sweet friends, this right here is offering something. I'm your host, Michael Bernier. You know, I love our sponsors. Enjoy your life brand, Riverwalk Brewing Company, and your organic natural shop. That's it. Everything you do, do it your best. You are the most beautiful you can ever be undoubtedly when you are being yourself it is you that we want i love you we'll check you next time you sweet 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 humans